Good morning, everyone. My name is Aditya Kumar, and um, as my colleague said, I'm the founder of an embedded consumer lending startup um, called Nero. To kick things off, um, I thought maybe we could do, you know, a little bit of um, sort of foretelling. Um, would love to get a quick introduction from both of you um, for the audience, and also just your general 35,000 foot view on what the shift of digital or the shift to digital payments means and its role in facilitating commerce. Thanks, Aditya. So, super happy to be here. Uh, my name is Venkatamni Prakash. Uh, I work for a company called Flyby, which is into cross-border payments for education, B2B, and travel. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to real-time payments, I think there is uh, there's enough and more use cases across the world where the destiny of the the destiny of commerce has really changed in those countries where real-time payments has come in. So, if we look at uh, if we look at Singapore, where pay now is sort of intrinsic to every transaction that happens in Singapore, or you look at Prom Pay in Thailand, which again is is super huge in terms of the number of transactions they do, uh, PIX in Brazil. What we have seen is there is a real contribution to the GDP that happens when real-time payments start coming to four. And that's what we've seen in, in India, right? So if I look at October numbers, if I look at November numbers, you know, 11 billion transactions have happened on UPI and some 17 trillion in terms of volume, yeah. I think, uh, and, and I generally feel that, you know, the government, the regulators have taken cognizance of the fact that here is a very, very important platform uh, that can aid multiple things in India. Yeah. Uh, till now, we had a limit of 100,000 on UPI, so you could only do so much. Uh, and then still we are ending up at about 11 billion in terms of number of transactions in a month. Uh, two days back, the news has come in hospital payments, medical payments, education payments, the transaction li limit has gone to about 500,000 INR, right? Now, I expect a lot of changes to happen on the UPI platform on, and on NPCI. I think uh, two things that if I have to mention, I, I look at, I would probably look at a lot of payment limit changes happening on NPCI. So you know that 100,000 limit will probably change, it will go to about, and, and you know, the governor, the RBI governor is actually talking about these things. Uh, I see a lot of changes around internationalization of UPI. So you know, I, I, there has already been uh, expansion in terms of UPI getting connected to PPRO in UK, UPI getting connected to PayNow in Singapore, and there are enough and more uh, you know, use cases around these connectivities. Uh, India receives roughly about 100 billion dollars inward in terms of remittances. India sends about 35 billion dollars in terms of outward remittances. When you attach UPI to these, it's a completely different ballgame. And I, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about cross-border payments. So, so that's the cross-border payment part. And then the minute you increase the, the transaction limit, the use cases will come to four in terms of whether the stamp duty payment can happen on UPI, whether you know a, a huge medical bill can be paid on UPI. I think these are the kind of things and use cases which will start coming to fore and in turn aid the growth of GDP. Today I would, I would assume by 2026, the entire UPI platform indirectly, directly will, con you know, by 2026 would be the number and the contribution to the GDP would be anywhere between 1% to 3%. And as you sort of increase the transaction limits, get more use cases in, that number will keep going up. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned, uh, I, I think the vision for 2030, they recently, uh, somebody from NPCI, the government put out was 100 billion transactions right. a month. Right. Saksham, a uh, quick introduction, please. Um, and the role of sort of digital payments in facilitating and driving commerce at scale. Hey, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Saksham Bhagat. I'm co-founder of a wealth tech startup, Swift Money. So we are planning to change the whole landscape of wealth management investments for India from tier three to tier one. Uh, so, so yes, Aditya, as you, so I'll answer that one thing you asked first, which is the 35,000 uh, feet view, which was, uh, you know, which I see as the payments of uh, 
uh, in, of the current scenario. So I have a friend of a friend who is living in US. Uh, so he called me and he said, I'm making a vlog. You got to help me out on this, which is how to pay the Indian way. So how the Indians are doing the transactions today. So they were actually planning to make a video. So we should be proud of that. So that's the current view. The whole world is seeing us in that way. So how to pay like Indians, that's the thing. So uh, yeah. And uh, so how I see these uh, the payments in uh, helping uh, in the digital commerce. So I always say people, there are three salesmen whenever you are selling anything online. First is, your, first is your advertisement, how you brought your customer in your app. Second is the user experience, what you are giving to that user. And third is, how do you make your payments so easy that there is very less time of that second thought? Should I buy it or not? Should I, is, will it be good enough or not? That payment part changes the most of that. So I'll give you an example of Zomato, right? So if my card's transaction fail, I recently I did that transaction, my card transaction failed. So Zomato automatically transferred it to cash on delivery. So you don't have to, you know, it does not give you a chance to do a second thought. So that's, that's how your third salesman is going to work. How easy you make your payments, how simple the payments are. That's going to be the third salesman. And as of now, uh, we see the consumer spending has been increased within from last five, six years. It has, it has drastically increased. So that is the proof that how this third uh, salesman of yours is working, the payments. The, the UPI, obviously. Another is uh, the pay later apps, how they made the whole scenario so easy. Like you don't even have to put a pin now. That's how easy they made it. So this payments, if, if made it even more easier in some way, it is going to be a huge uh, you know, advantage for digital commerce that your third salesman is going to work absolutely fine. So yes, that's it. Awesome. Saksham, you mentioned credit, so maybe we'll just stay on that topic for a second. How do you see the role of credit, right? In, um, I mean, one is today paying through effectively debit methods or for example for the tiny portion of the population that has a card using a credit card but for a vast majority of the population it's either UPI, um, a debit card uh, or some other form of debit instrument. How do you see the role of credit insofar as this third salesman um, and what role is that going to play especially contextualized when you know a lot of the BNPL startups in India haven't really proven to be very very you know very profitable uh, and many of them obviously haven't been able to survive. Any, any thoughts there? So this credit part is one of the most interesting part around when it comes to digital commerce or maybe in any site. Why? Because, okay, I'll tell you very much in a psychological way. When you're paying from a credit card, the mental image is I have to pay it 50 days from now, which is mostly not the case. Like you, you are doing mid of the month, what? 10, 20 days baad hi karna hota, but the mental image is you have to pay 50 days baad mein. So abhi kya hai? Abhi to nahi dena hai na. It's okay, it's okay. So, Par consumer ka mindset change ho jata. It's like, he's like, okay, abhi kharid leta hon, I'll pay it later. It goes in that way. So credit card or these BNPLs, all of these apps works on this psychological trick only. Right? You don't have to pay it right now, pay it later aram se, right? This specifically, I have personally seen, so uh, when we were building Swift Money, we actually used to do a lot of surveys. We used to sit in co-working spaces, we used to go to everyone, whole day, 9 hours, 10 hours, we used to just talk to them. We used to talk to them and we used to identify what is the mindset of the user. How do you really think when you are buying anything? So earlier we were planning to make it more of a money manager, like com combining money manager. So that's where we wanted, uh, we had this need of how to identify how our consumer thinks only when paying or whatever he is doing. So we realized this people do not even understand the value, uh, the concept of time value of money, but still they use credit card like anything because baad mein dena, right? And uski wajah se they used to buy the most unnecessary things, the most unnecessary things. Uh, anything you see on the internet, there's like so you know there are oh, back scratchers and stuff which are literally the most unnecessary things. And people used to buy these sort of things. Essay, maze mein, because 50 days baad dena, koi nahi. Salary aayegi tab de denge. That's इतना बड़ा इफेक्ट करता है ये क्रेडिट आपके डिजिटल कॉमर्स में 
it never and so i also have a travel tech company in north india we have mr cabby it's a cab aggregator service so until we introduce this pay later and credit cards earlier we never did payments uh, on the credit cards and uh, these credit uh, uh, pay now uh, the pay later apps until we started this people never used to book uh, online they used to call us they used to be like okay send us a cab and something it's it's, it's like 2015 2014 they used to be like send us send us the cab and that's it the moment we started this credit card as well as this buy now pay later it changed the whole game we used to be like okay you can pay via your credit card just book via our website and change the whole game so today oh, more than the earlier it used to be 100% on calls or via the partners now it's like 70% on website and app and 30% via partners and so this is the huge shift which happened just because of this credit so yeah awesome uh, prakash what about in cross border payments do you see an uptick in either the need for or the utilization of credit and actually facilitating in your case larger ticket payments abroad yeah so you know there are two three facets around you know if i if i sort of look at upi credit and cross border payments so you know if i look at three elements around cross border payments i think uh, the first part which we probably need to sort of get used to is the tax structures around this so india has done a lot of changes around the way taxes are calculated on cross border payments yeah so there has been a lot of action uh, by the cbdt around this uh, that's because only 1% of us pay taxes in india right so that that's how it is so uh, so government wants to monitor these payments very closely because they want to understand who are these payments who are making who are these payers who are sort of making about $60000 payment abroad who are these payers who end up buying properties abroad they are making investment in apple stocks and incidentally are not tax payers so you know government wants to actually monitor these people very very closely and rightfully so so you know government has recently increased the taxes on cross border payments to about 20% so if you if you end up sending $10000 you end up paying 20% tax on that payment yeah of course you know education and medical payments are exempt out of it when i look at so you know the tax is an important element and that plays a role in the way transactions happen for cross border payments the second piece when i look at credit uh, especially in the in context of cross border payments one of the important elements of credit there is when an education loan is taken and money is sent abroad yeah so that's one form of credit yeah and it's a very very large business for example state bank of india uh, roughly disburses about 500 million dollars annually on cross border education loans right and uh, you know that credit and that that part of credit becomes very important in how the funds is being sort of sent out of the country and then i you know when when we look at that you know when we look at the taxes when we look at this form of credit and the third part around what is the payment method that is going to be used to send the funds across right cross border now you know one form of pay payment is credit card so you know you can you know credit card is is one of the most sort of uh, least preferred methods to make that payment because you know don't, you don't really have transaction limits when you make huge cross border payments the other is debit card you have transaction limits uh, but really you know you have to sort of get all the authentication right and the transaction needs to happen and you know payment gateways will always have a challenge in terms of auth rates so that's you know that's where it becomes slightly more cumbersome when it comes to debit card so in our experience at, at flyware whatever we have, you know we have when we have seen these elements we have seen the traditional way of making the payment for cross border payments right so we have we have a we, for us for example for flyware we have sort of been fairly innovative in terms of how we want to sort of control the cross border payment so if you go to flyware and you want to make a cross border payment for education so one of the methods that you will see is that you can if you are an icici bank customer you can log into net banking and complete the payment whether it's a whether there is a credit involved or not you can still make the
payment out by logging into ICICI Money to World, and you know you can complete the transaction. Same with HDFC Bank, and now recently we've gone live with State Bank of India on online SBI. That also has a transaction limit of $25,000, but still. This is the way we are trying to see whether we can navigate the 100,000 INR limit on UPI. Yeah, and, and that's where you know our pitch to the regulator has always been to look at these transaction limits very, very closely because that's super important in terms of credit and cross-border payments. Thanks. You mentioned UPI, um, and you in, uh, earlier on mentioned the sort of interoperability of, uh, of UPI beyond Indian borders. What role does that play, and how does that change the landscape of actually, how does UPI's interoperability with payment systems in the UK, in Singapore, in other countries actually impact cross-border payments? Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, India is, you know, if, if I look at some of the countries, India, Philippines, China, they are very large markets for inward remittances. So there are, there, there are diaspora population who are abroad who send funds back into India. Yeah? Any form of interoperability essentially aids that money movement, right? So the first, uh, you know, the first uh, association that NPCI got into was with, com with this company called PayNow in Singapore. And PayNow is sort of fairly, uh, you know, ubiquitous in, in Singapore. And the idea there is essentially be super smooth in terms of transaction in a way where KYC is not asked for the transaction. Yeah, and then KYC is super, super intrinsic to a cross-border payment and the minute you remove the KYC layer, the, the regulatory layer around cross-border payments, everything becomes easy. Yeah, and, and, and the fact of the matter is that while the, the plan is super ambitious, the aim is predominantly to ease up the money movement. And, and when I'm talking about the money movement, I'm talking about money coming into India and money going out of India, you know? And, and essentially, what we have seen is that as India grows, um, India would want to also, Indian population would want to sort of buy from Amazon UK instead of buying from Amazon India, right? And those are the sort of behaviors which will definitely come, yeah? When that comes in, there has to be a clear part towards how the transaction will happen. So, you know, these associations will become super important. I see companies like Stripe becoming very big in India because, you know, they are solving for cross-border payments, right? Even in India? They are. Yeah, they, they are. They have a, in fact, you know, uh, there are companies like Stripe, there are companies like Ping Pong X who have actually taken license from Air Wallex. They've taken company, they have taken a license from RBI to manage cross-border payments. Yeah. So I see a lot of action happening and, you know, these associations, the expansion of NPCI is actually solving those use cases of money coming into India and money going out of India. Awesome. What about um, how does, does UPI and do these increased limits, I know they're restricted to certain categories at the moment, but does it help fund flows into various investment classes? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it, it surely does. It surely does because... Of, so now, just just to give an idea, the mutual fund market is close to 50 lakh crores. Okay, which was what is that? 50 lakh crores means whole mutual fund market of balances India. outstanding. Yes, yes, whole yes, the the whole industry of mutual fund. It's close to 50 lakh crores. How it went to a, a, the, how it went to close to that 50 lakh crore number? It's the major part. I am saying it again. That third salesman worked really well around it. UPI is, so you could directly buy mutual funds via UPI and you know, you can even in your broker app, you could directly transfer funds via UPI. It was too easy. So I, so earlier a guy told me that, you know, used to, just to transfer payment, you have to, you had to do a lot, right? So personally, I never faced that, but uh, this, this is the thing. So that third salesman is working even in the investment industry. So I, I give you an example. So there, so with Swift Money, there is a person who is investing. Uh, he's close to 67, 68. So that guy has seen that whole era where you used to go to bank to you know transfer funds and hold that process around it. So now, he, so when we asked him, would you like to invest money? He was like, nahi, wo to ja ke paise jama karane padenge. And all that hassle bustle he has to do. We told him, no, you don't have to do anything. You sit at home. UPI is going to do the most of work. So that guy was extremely happy and that guy also invested money. So if you can see that, so there, there are a lot of people who have this hindrance. 
how will the money get transferred so now after increasing the limits now it's 5 lakhs so it's actually a very good number so post this we 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 can actually expect more increase in later stages maybe with some regulatory framework around it but once like these uh, limits increase you will definitely see more uh, flows inside this uh, you know investments world and absolutely it's going to happen yeah. awesome prakash uh, to you i think the regulator has been spoken about quite a lot right how do you see the role of the regulator going forward right they've obviously been quite prudent when it comes to overall payments licensing um, you know prudent some might say conservative some might say you know over careful um, how do you see the role of the regulator as it stands currently both in the payment space as well as in the facilitation of cross border payments uh, and what are your sort of what's on your wish list from the regulator very very relevant question when you you know you when you are talking about payments you are talking about cross border payments when you are talking about upi i think the the regulatory angle is super important especially when we are talking about things like cbdcs and you know digital currencies and all of that right i think i would say that the regulator uh, and reserve bank of india has been extremely forward looking over the last couple of years in terms of how they are looking at the payment landscape and also cross border fund flow yeah one of the one of the reasons uh, you know one of the reasons they are looking at it this way is because when there is you know funds coming into india and that's aiding in investments and in you sort of elevating poverty in one way you know and there are enough and numbers and enough insights there uh, to prove that right government wants to sort of take that context into picture uh, while deciding in every course of action uh two important things have happened from a regulatory side uh rbi has set up an innovation center in bangalore yeah and and that that sort of aiding all action around how the payment landscape will you know sort of needs to be defined for the next 10 years a lot of action there and a lot of new initiatives coming to fore uh the other important thing the regulator has started doing very very closely is uh taking a sandbox approach to every new initiative that they want to sort of set set up right so one of the one of the sandbox for example just to sort of talk about a specimen one of the sandbox uh project that the reserve bank of india had taken up is to figure out a way in terms of how an indian peer can buy stocks in nasdaq yeah so that's one of the use cases that that sort of uh that rbi had taken up RBI had taken up another sandbox project which was how to sort of do cross border payments in a exclusive corridor way on things like mastercard send or visa direct you know so that's the sand- second sort of sandbox approach that sandbox project that RBI had sort of taken up so one is you know this forward looking approach of using sandboxes and trying to come and and trying to sort of define a method the second piece that they were they are focusing on the sort of di- sort of digitizing kyc you know I, earlier you know if you if you had to do a cross border payment if you had to buy foreign exchange you would physically have to sign something called an lrs form you know so you would have to put your signature and all of that used to happen rbi this was only this is a development in the last two months rbi has said that you don't really need to sort of sign you know you don't need to put a wet signature on a lrs form you know it can be digitized and you know it's just the entity which is sort of doing the foreign exchange sale needs to do the due diligence and it should be okay so i think the role of regulator is super important it's been a very very positive approach from the reserve bank of india and other regulated financial intelligence unit and things like that uh positive approach and and they are being extremely careful as well saksham role of the regulator and your wish list for helping channelize more funds into different kinds of savings instruments Oh yeah. Uh, so last time we were here at ICS last year, the this sort of similar question came up. So what I said last year was, regulator is always the land you build your building on. <laughs> It can come any moment, and if you do not uh, make your building as per the land, your building is going to fall down. So, so yes. So I think uh, how regulator regulator is the biggest player when it comes to the investment industry. how uh, sebi has came up with a lot of new things how mp is actually uh, doing its part really well mp it's a, not a regulator but yeah it's it's working uh, as as an association it's working really good uh, it is uh, taking 
this mutual fund sahi had two masses so you know even the tier 3 tier 4 people should be able to invest in uh, mutual funds and they should have the clarity that what they are sebi similarly coming with a lot of new things like uh, we just heard sebi is doing t plus 0 a t plus 1 right the, both of these so the moment you the day you do the transaction next day you will have the money and the other the day you did transaction you will have the money in your bank account uh, these sort of small small so there are no silver bullets when it comes to increasing in any part there is always like few lead bullets you have to shoot every day and that's how i think regulator is working combining this all the regulators sebi rbi these guys are working in a way that some way or the other you can increase the fund flow in the markets and keeping the risk at its minimal level that's why they are uh, so now you you guys might open your uh, stock market uh, broker apps and you might see a uh, you know that disclaimer that don't do trading and 90% people lose money in trading so say sebi and all the regulators understand this whole concept that you know you need to fill markets with money and that's how they are going to grow but taking but keeping the risk at the most minimal level and that's how i and the regulators currently are working really well i don't think there is specifically any uh, wish list of mine but one wish list uh, uh, so as as you mentioned around this uh, you know the cross border payments that a person sitting in india should be able to do the transactions in nasdaq or nyse with the easiest payment method which is the upi if that if those sort of things also can happen in future in near future it's going to be really good awesome and uh, i think we heard the first part already so just before we wrap up or maybe if we have time for questions um so thing for the future big trends in cross border payments big trends in savings for all uh, what do you see coming in the next 12 to 24 months uh, in fact i will talk about payments and also talk about cross border specifically uh, so i see the extension of upi in more use cases that's the first trend that i sort of envisage because for example you know last month i made a lic payment on upi scanning the qr code which was unthinkable you know some time back right uh, so more use cases you you know you buy tickets on irctc and all that yeah uh, cross border a lot of digitization you know uh, lack you know sort of reduction in the number of documents being collected um, checks and balances increase in taxes will definitely happen they want to sort of be very clear uh, in terms of who is the payer who is making such large payments abroad yeah uh, one more important trend that i see in india coming up you know is the growth of super apps yeah uh, where upi is probably the bedrock on which it is sort of built on uh, you know you go to china everything happens on a wechat pay or an alipay right so mini programs purchase of groceries everything happens on wechat pay yeah that's what we have seen yeah in indonesia everything happens on gojek on on in singapore everything happens on grab right so i think there is there is going to be a lot of initiatives around developing super apps it's really not come to four tata try to do something but it's not really come to four but upi being the bedrock i i see a lot of super app opportunities in india i don't know why some you know an entity like irctc is actually not building a super app very interesting saksham so considering uh, the investment side where i come from uh, i'll just speak around that so in investment side we are definitely going to see a lot of apps and a lot of companies being built just for tier 3 and tier 4 cities because now india has realized that there is a lot of potential around it earlier the money used to be hidden now with the janthan yojana and you know uh, all those initiatives government has taken the tier 3 and tier 4s are coming out really well really well even we so we a started the pilot project of swift money with tier 3 tier 4 towns and we were surprised we didn't know that this sort of money and this sort of mindset is in tier 3 and tier 4s so i think the micro savings app as well as you know investments and wealth wealth apps for tier 3 and tier 4 are going to come and in next 24 months we are going to see you know a lot of companies doing that because the real potential is lying there and tier 1s are too much over tapped so yeah <laughs> awesome guys i don't know if we have time for questions but okay thank you so much